It's half past nine. Half past nine. I got thirty minutes. Uh, okay. Um, I don't. I, mean, I don't want to, want to keep you. Uh, if you're right, what I want to do is I do want to get back with you. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to figure out maybe we should just finish this call. I'll, I'm allowed fifteen minutes at a time. Right. And then I can call Bill back. Yeah. He's probably sitting right by the phone when it <laughs> happens. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I think he'll get over. Why don't we just finish this? You know. Yeah. Continue talking and then. Um, sure. Uh, and then I'll just call him later. Yeah. Can you just have a? Have a um, do you mind if I record some of this? On the phone right now? Yeah. Um, listen, we're going to have plenty of time to do this. Why don't we just talk informally? Sure, okay. I would prefer that now. Okay. You know, that way I can get kind of a feeling for what you're doing. Sure. And, uh, you know, and I wouldn't, I'm not, um, I don't object to an interview. Mm -hmm. Um I just, you know, at this point, you know, we can, you know, pick it up tomorrow, uh, perhaps. Sure, okay. Yeah, I just kind of want to get a feel for what's going on here. Yeah. I and mean, all I've heard of your music, uh, I heard obviously the uh, you know, Lucifer Rising, and from I heard the stuff that you know, Bill gave me the other day. I've heard nothing in between. Uh, I mean, I'm just amazed you managed to keep your uh, you know, your music going in in prison all these years. I'm just knocked out by that. Yeah, that's been a struggle, but uh, you know, I don't think anybody else has ever recorded a movie soundtrack. No, well, no, no. It's I'm just astonished, really. That was quite a that was quite a unique. Everybody told me I wouldn't be able to, to get approval to do it and all of that, but uh, I just happened to have a, a warden that was sympathetic. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I guess I presented it to him in a good way, and uh, yeah. it worked out. Right. And I actually did the mix. You know, uh, the most of the recordings were done in the, in the music room, uh, which is a, actually a there was no no music program when I when I got to Tracy uh, where that was uh, Tracy Prison where that was recorded, mm -hmm. and. Um, I had, you know, I started a music program, managed to get us a place to practice, an old barber shop we converted. Mm -hmm. And that was where most of the recordings were done. It was done they were done over a, a number of years, actually. Mm -hmm. um, in between lockdowns, there was a lot of uh, violent activity back in those days. And, uh, it was hard to get time in the music room. So right. it took a long time, and guys would parole, go home, get transferred, or whatever. So the band was con continuously changing. Right, right. Uh, so there's a lot of different musicians on there. Then finally, after I had about... I don't know, a dozen reels of tape mm -hmm. of just basically us jamming on themes that I had composed. Yes. Uh, then, you know, I did all the final editing and mixing in myself. Mm -hmm. I was allowed to take the re recording equipment and uh, my two open reel decks and, and uh, convert myself to, to a little tiny uh, studio and, mm -hmm. uh, and did the editing and the mix there. Right. Mm. But it's just astonishing what you've achieved there, I and mean, the quality, I mean, quality all around, you know, technical quality, musical quality, is just amazing, really. Okay. Just, just knocks out. I really am. I mean, an important uh, thing in, in the program I'm making, let's just say the radio program I'm doing, is uh, to show that, I mean, you, that, I mean, everybody knows that you know, Manson wrote, wrote music, or you know, he wrote songs, at least. But I'm trying to show that you know there were actually a lot of quite creative people got involved. And that I was sucked into it, or, or you know, however you want to put that. Right. But well, my connection there. Yeah. Um, see, that's one. That's why I wanted to speak with you informally, because sure. man, you know, to have my to have the work that I've done, my music and whatnot, to you know, to be kind of sucked back into. Well, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to extricate uh, the, the the quality of what you're doing and indeed the art of what you're doing from all that. Right, well, uh, I hope so. Because, yeah. You know, that's the thing. I don't want to, oh, you know, hear some more Manson family. Well, exactly. I mean, um, it's... It never was that to begin with. Yeah, right. Certainly, it no. wasn't done... Um, no. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's been quite apart from all of that. Sure. No, I, I understand that. Um, but, I mean, what, what you were doing was in a completely different dimension to what he was doing or trying to do. I mean, it's perfectly clear that he, he was, at best... <coughs> excuse me. He was, at best, um, a, a sort of moderately talented amateur, whereas you were just straight ahead of that. All right. Well, he's, he had some, some interesting lyrical um, talents. Yeah. And which was uh, attracting to both Dennis and myself. Yeah. And other people. Uh -huh. um, you knew Dennis? Yeah. Because uh -huh. I knew Dennis wasn't very well. Yeah, so did I. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah he, was a, he was a good friend. And, um, uh, you know, I... There, you know, my attraction to Manson was his music. Mm -hmm. it wasn't into his uh, philosophy. Really. <laughs> you know, right. Wasn't into his into the uh, the cult thing. I've always been too much of a too independent. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, to sort of like uh, allow myself to be assimilated into something like that. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, and it, it was always a, a struggle, but I just, I, I, I had listened to his music, I'd heard him play, um, in fact, he borrowed some of my chord changes and, and for a couple of his songs. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that, uh, that was really the attraction for me, was his talent as a songwriter. I wanted to get him in the studio uh, to record you know, some demos of his, of his songs. Yeah. Apart from, you know, it, we, we tried it a couple of times, he had, of course he had to drag all, along all these girls and yeah. tambourine players and all of that, and uh, so as a result, very few good recordings. Developed. Do you remember a guy called Steve Desper? He was an engineer. No. <clears throat> he engineered some of the sessions at Brian's house. Ah. And uh, I, him. I spoke to him, and he, he remembers it all very well. He, but in fact, what he said is pretty, pretty much what you said. You know, Manson was a lyricist more than anything else. Exactly. And he said the big problem with Manson was that there was simply no way that Manson would let himself be produced. You know. Exactly, and, and, and yeah. well, that was that was the problem. Yeah. You know, he had no respect for it. It was all part of this sort of machinery thing that uh, he kind of despised. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, so he entered into it with no no concept of the discipline that's required to get a good recording. Right, um, right. And, and and certainly, you know, you and I both know that it can be done without you know, um, you know, stealing your soul. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's it like this uh, this notion of. You know uh, that it was it would steal his soul if he you know allowed himself to be directed right you know yeah uh, by a producer by somebody who understood the medium and could translate what he was trying to do recognize what he was trying to do and translate it to the recorded medium mm -hmm. um, it's just a shame that uh, that it happened that way you know right so, yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, the more, the more you look at the cult side of things, the, 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 the more it sort of dissolves in your hands, in a way. I mean, as I've been, you know, I talked to all sorts of people, and then I had a, I've got to tell you, I had a really nightmarish afternoon with Sandra Gerb the other day. Oh, oh God, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I mean, she's... Charlie's nuts. Well, yeah, I mean, she's crazier than she ever was. I mean, she alternates between raptures about Charlie and threatening to kill you, you know, when, she, when you talk to her. I mean, she's just, she's yeah, bad so. Yeah. But she, man, she was telling me, you know, that Charlie was the greatest musician who ever walked the earth. All, all you can do is just sit there and nod. Because you do anything else, you get yeah, something thrown. enough on acid, of course, it sounds like a <laughs> Right. Uh, well, don't worry about, you know, but, but if I use your music, and I, I, mean, I hope I'm going to get to use your music and Emerson, it, there's no question of saying that this is Mansonite music. Um, in fact, what, what the the way it would come out, the way I want to use it, would be more a matter of saying, this is what Mansonism obscured. Do you, do you follow me? Oh, I understand. Yeah, you know, which I, th I would. How I feel about it. I would. I would hope that that's the way you'd see it yourself. Ah, oh, thank you. Because um, I, mean, I really am knocked out by the quality of what you're what you're doing there, and you know, we would think this would be a way to actually get some of your stuff heard, because it's not going to get heard otherwise in Britain. At least not 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 for the time being. Right. So you know, if you can get me you know, a first generation or second generation or DAT or something, you know, we'll, I'll get it out there for you. Which uh, which piece do you like the best? Out of curiosity. Well, and Bill didn't give me didn't give me the titles of these things. I've got four of them in a row. Um, <laughs> I like the second one best, is all I can tell you. <laughs> this one uh, that I, it probably has the best production on it. But, you know, the drums sound the most realistic. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, there's more, I think, diversity in the, um, there's, a, there's a flute in it, and, you know, it's, it's a, one called Modern Barbarians, which was a, a radio program that was done by KUSP. Mm -hmm. uh, it was part of a radio program called Stars Behind Bars. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, was a, it was a national, uh, you know, it was a public radio broadcast. Mm -hmm. Our program uh, produced in Soledad Prison. I co-engineered the audio on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really, you know, um, really something that, anyway, that was a, a self-composed, um, self-performed, self-recorded piece, uh, Modern Barbarian. Of course, most of them are uh, that you've got there. I don't know which one she gave you. Mm. <laughs> uh, Ohm's Law is one of them, it mm. starts with, which starts with a gong. That's called Ohm's Law. Right. I think, yes, that is on the top. Right. And then there's mm. one that starts off with sort of like a harp, uh, arpeggiated harp sound. Mm -hmm. And that was... Um, that was uh, that was variations on a, on canon, you know, Paco Bell's canon. Yes. Yeah. Right. So that's that's the uh, you know can, uh, just called canon variations, and then Ohm's law, which is the one that starts with the gong type sound. Do you know the version of Paco Bell's canon that Van Dyke Parks did? No. Do you know, do you know Van Dyke? Mm -mm. Do, you, do you know him? 
Pardon me? Do you know Van Dyke Parks? No, I don't. He was um, a friend of Brian's. Brian Wilson. You know, that's funny. You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't know any of Dennis' brothers. I didn't know. Uh, I went to a studio session once, and they, they seemed kind of lame, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dennis I really liked. Yeah. I really liked Dennis. But, uh, you, know, you know, not that I, you know, I don't think that, that Brian didn't do some great things. I'm sure mm. you know, he did. Yeah. Um, in fact, the whole band. But uh, as far as, you know, the, as far as the, the, the Wilsons, they had the soul, I think, was Dennis. Mm -hmm. you know, and he just kind of... It's too bad, I think, that, that uh, more of him wasn't, uh, I don't know. Did you get to hear his solo album? I've never heard of Pacific Ocean Blue, isn't that it? Uh -huh. think, uh, yeah, Pacific Ocean Blue, isn't that the title of it? That's right. Yeah, you, you, I wanted to hear it. I've never heard it. Can, can you receive t t um, tapes of the present? Well, it, it's, I don't know. I'm up in Oregon now, so it's going to, yeah. it's gonna t I don't even know where I'm at yet or what yeah. I'm allowed to have or, or what, you know. Because I tell you, I've got, um, I mean, I've, obviously I've got Pacific Ocean Blue. Right. But I've also got all the session tapes for all the stuff that was left when he died. Oh, really? Yeah, all the stuff he was working on. I was some nice songs. Yeah, right. I mean, but, we used to sit on the piano um, in his little basement apartment. I remember, uh, who was the guy that lived upstairs? Uh, um, he was also a friend of Manson's. Greg Jacobson. Greg, mm. right. Uh, Greg, uh, you know, he used to, uh, you know, Dennis was living in his little kind of... Um, room, basement room or whatever. Did you know him during that, that period? No, no, I first met him in 72. Oh, this was yeah, much later then. Mm -hmm. um, and we, anyway, we used to sit down there with the upright piano and, uh, he, you know, mm -hmm. around with some of his songs, you know. Mm -hmm. He's doing some nice things. Well, if I can, if you can you know, receive tapes, I'd gladly send you some of this something. Stuff. Listen, yeah. uh, that little beep was the uh, end of the call coming up. What, uh, what time tomorrow would be best? Well, you, you name it. Um, Gee, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'll, uh, probably it will be after ten o'clock in the morning. Okay. Um, I d I've got to do some testing and stuff, so I don't know. I'm gonna sure. Have, may we may have to. Um, I don't know how much time I'll have in the morning. Mm -hmm. Got a level? Okay, we're rolling. <laughs> right. Um. What can we talk about? Can we talk about your um, your musical background and stuff? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. How did you get into music originally? Uh, I found a guitar in my grandmother's attic when I was about 11 or 12 years old. It was an old, uh, I'm, I'm not sure who it belonged to. I think it might have belonged to my mother or uh, possibly uh, my uncle uh, or brother. Um, and it was just a, an old cheapo uh, guitar and... Uh, of course, I, you know, I think I was always attracted to music. I just couldn't, you know, I couldn't, uh, my family couldn't afford to buy me a guitar or, or much of an instrument. And uh, uh, they did give me a few piano lessons prior to that, but, the, you know, they, that, that didn't go very far. And uh, but the discovery of the guitar was, was uh, just set me on, you know, set me on that path. Because, right. you know, it gave me an instrument I could sit, you know, sit in my room and and, uh, and play, fool around with. You know, at first I, I uh, you know, just experimented with, I didn't know how to tune a guitar, I just tuned it until it sound, sounded good to me and then played. Who would you say were your early influences then? Uh, early influences? Uh, that's, that's really kind of hard to say. Um, you know, of course the rock, you know, the rock music of the, of the times was, uh, you know, during the times when I was growing up, which was, uh, you know, pre-Beatles. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Little Richard, of course. Uh, uh, a lot of the R&B stuff that was out, and, and you know the top 40 stuff that was out, even you know Ricky Nelson. Um, you know I didn't I didn't really have any. Um, I don't know if I you know I don't recall having any any real strong favorites. I like the surf music. Um, I, think, I think there was probably a strong influence in the surf music because I did you know have a, a an instrumental bent, and that was uh, uh, you know some of the surf music that was out. Of, Dick Dale. It was, it was instrumental. So you like people like Dick Dale? And, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. They owned the Deltones. The Pyramids. Pardon me? The Pyramids. Remember them? I don't recall the Pyramids. <laughs> they, was, uh, they, they were the... Yeah, what, what was the name of the, the, the Ventures? Oh, yeah. They, yeah. they did a lot of... Uh, yeah. uh, a lot of instrumental things. Right. Um, well, the earliest music that I know of yours um, is the, the score you did for Lucifer Rising. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that? 
Um, well, actually, I, I mean, do you, do you really uh, do you really want history? <laughs> well, no. Well, it's, what, what, do you, what, what would you like to talk about? I mean, well, I did. Uh, you know, I did a lot of work in Los Angeles, or a lot of playing in Los Angeles with. Uh, you know, you might, you might recall uh, the band uh, Love, Arthur Lee's band. Mm -hmm. I did uh, play with them for a while before they were actually called Love. They were called the Grassroots, and then another band called the Grassroots recorded out of San Francisco and. Uh, that you know required because they had recorded first. The, uh, the band had to change its name, and um, it was changed to Love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I had done a lot of work prior to, prior to doing the film soundtrack, and uh, uh, I had a band. Uh, in fact, uh, the band I was playing with when I was first uh, involved with Kenneth Anger was the orchestra, which is uh, a pretty well-known band in San Francisco. Uh, you know, late 60s, 60, between 65 and, uh, and 67. And uh, it was, you know, it was a, a little concert thing. Well, actually, it wasn't a concert. It was a, a three-day festival um, at Glide Memorial Church. The orchestra that uh, my band was in, a strange, kind of a strangely instrumented band. Um, we had a, an electric violin, electric oboe, a bright bass, um, and a, a, a drummer with with his kit enhanced with things like kettle drums and uh, other per percussive devices. And, uh, you know, we had kind of a strange sound. That's why we called ourselves the orchestra. Originally, my, my idea was to, you know, have like a, a 15 or, or 20 piece instrumental rock orchestra. But in the final analysis, to find that many people compatible, and of course I couldn't pay them, you know, it was like, you, you come and join the band, and if we make any money, then you'll make money. Mm -hmm. So uh, it just it, it finally came down to after trying out probably 40 different people, you know, and have uh, a lot of different people pass through the band or pass through the music group. Um, we finally we came down to five guys, and it turned out to be more of a band than an orchestra. But we stuck with the with, with the orchestra name, and uh, even though we, you know we changed the spelling, O R K U S T R A, and. Uh, that was, you know, that we called ourselves for a while the Chamber Orchestra, and then it just became the orchestra, and we played. Managed to get these people to uh, open up the this cathedral to us, 
for a three day uh, do anything goes kind of uh, kind of thing. And they, the Diggers invited us to put on um, a, a bit of a music, uh, actually accompaniment to some belly dancers. Uh, it was you know like a, it was a secret event that had been planned behind the scenes and. Uh, there were a lot of surprises during this three-day festival. Are you, have you heard about this, by the way? No, I haven't, actually. You, uh, you, you did, caught me here. <laughs> did you ever read a book called um, Ringo Levio by Emmett Grogan? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, this event was, you know, from his perspective, was uh, you know, was written about in his story. Um, and he, he goes into it, I think, in more detail than I will. Um, you know, his angle, his, his, uh, his plan on the whole thing was certainly different than mine. You know, mine was... You know, being involved with the orchestra and being invited to play uh, accompaniment for these belly dancers. It was about a dozen belly dancers or so. They had set up a false wall in uh, in the in the back of this little auditorium. It was you know a false wall made out of paper, which from the other side looked like uh, you know the real wall. And there was a poetry uh, reading being conducted uh, in the main room behind this false wall the band was set up and all these belly dancers topless belly dancers were gathered uh, and at a, you know, at a uh, given time we we, uh, we began playing and belly dancers busted through this paper wall into this crowd of people and the idea was uh, you know to try to get everybody making love in this in this uh, <laughs> which you know it was fairly successful yeah. uh, a lot of things were going on it was really uh, quite a quite an event but anyway, it was during this, uh, this, you had asked me how I became involved in this soundtrack with uh, Kenneth Anger, and that was, I went on this long roundabout way of telling you that Kenneth Anger was in the uh, uh, Glide Memorial Church uh, uh, attending the poetry reading, and he saw me playing, uh, you know, with the band. It, you know, it got really hot and sweaty, so, you know, a lot of people were kind of taking their clothes off. And I had one of the belly dancers, uh, a girl by the name of Samantha, a really beautiful blonde girl woman uh i had stood her on a on a, a chair uh next to me while i was playing and uh just you know we were we had a sort of uh, uh <laughs> impromptu improvisational dance uh, erotic dance uh, that we were doing together mm-hmm. uh, you know while i was playing and while she was dancing uh, and kenneth anger saw this he wanted me to star in his movie horizon so he saw me after after the uh, the gig and, uh, and asked me about it, gave me his address, and, uh, uh, said that he was also interested in the music, but I think he was really interested in me having, you know, you know playing a role in the film uh, more than he was in the music. But that did, you know, it did, as we became involved with each other, it did evolve. It did uh, turn out that he would, he would have me doing the music and I would be, um, you know, doing whatever it was he wanted me to do in front of the camera because of the film. Is it true that you kidnapped the, the print or something? No, that, was, um, that never happened. Because it was one of these great little legends. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. It, and it, it, what happened there was, uh, God. <laughs> we had a, we, you know, after we had worked together for quite quite a while, actually, um, we'd done some filming, and it, he never actually had told me that he was doing any filming for the film. We had done a lot of these, like, test things, you know? And he was testing out various lighting, um, and I would, you know, would model different costumes in front of the camera and uh, and so forth. But you know, he was never saying, "Okay, now we're doing the film." You know, I was meanwhile working with a band. I had a different band. The orchestra uh, wanted to go its own direction. Um, the guys in the band, uh, David Laflamme of uh, "It's a Beautiful Day," was uh, violinist in the orchestra. He wanted, he had some commercial. Um, things that he wanted to do and it wasn't the same direction that I wanted to go so the orchestra broke up uh, the bass player Jamie Leopold went with Dan Hicks and the Hot Licks and anyway the band went in separate ways and so I formed a different band called the Magic Powerhouse of Oz and I was you know working with this with this band uh, while Kenneth was doing whatever he did and I would just kind of see him every so often mm-hmm. and uh, we would do a little filming and uh, or we'd get together for some social gathering we had friends there that were, were potential um um, you know, potential investors. So I would have to be there and we would, you know, anyway, try to sell his film project. What happened with the this thing, this thing about me being, having stolen the film, um, Kenneth had uh, a lot of money invested in his project from um, 
uh, I think it was a group of German people invested quite a bit of money and other people. And he didn't have a film to show for it, and it became convenient to say that I had stolen the film, and that's why he couldn't deliver. But it never, never happened. <laughs> I mean, one thing I really don't want to talk to you about, as I said to you last night, is Charles Manson. Except for this one thing, there seemed to be a lot of musicians with him. Because mm -hmm. um, I mean, there wasn't just yourself. I mean, Steve Brogan played the guitar and sang. Because uh, Manson himself was, was a musician. But I mean, I heard that um, one of the girls played the horn and things. Played what? The horn. No, there was a guy who played a horn. Mm -hmm. um, he just, you know, he had, I guess, had a few French horn lessons when he was in uh, school or something. And played a couple of times. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it didn't really quite fit with what Charlie was doing. What was your impression of Charlie as a musician? Uh, as a musician, he, he, he had a, definitely his own style. And, you know, he prided himself in not playing uh, into, in a set meter, you know. Um, he wanted to be out of time, you know. And uh, that was interesting. Um, uh, being an improvisational musician, I was one of probably. Oops. Listen, I'm going to have to call you back. That's their signal. Okay. Uh, and we can pick it up there. Remind me where we're talking, and I'll pick it up. Pick okay. It up a bit. All right, I'll dial, dial you right back right now. Okay. 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 You know, I, as far as, you know, Charlie's playing, you know, uh, whether you like it or whether you don't like it, it as, as with all music, it's, you know, it's sort of a, a subjective experience. And I kind of liked what he was doing, and at times I didn't like what he was doing, you know. Um, as a lyricist, I thought that's where, where most of his talents lay. I was uh, intrigued by his style of uh, composing songs, uh, and, and in particular, in composing lyrics. I mean, things that he would make up on the, on the spot, you know, that would just come spontaneously, um, were uh, good. I mean, he was doing some good stuff, some, some fascinating things. Um, and then, of course, you know, I came from uh, a tradition, you know, my own self-developed tradition of uh, playing improvisationally, you know, playing as nature plays, you know. That's always been my, uh, my, main, my main thing, I guess, you know, my, uh, my main interest. Um, Would you say music was an important part of life on the run? Life on the ranch. You know, I don't really know that much about life on the ranch because I didn't live there. Oh. I used to come out and visit every so often, like a lot of people did. Um, but yeah, I would say, yeah, I would say music had quite a lot to do with it, to what was going on there. Uh, Charlie would, you know, would be, I guess, pretty much a nightly sort of uh, thing. Sometimes daytimes too. You know, gathering around and, and singing. Yeah, I think I would think uh, that. Yeah, that would be true. To yes, there was a lot. Because this is something which isn't really understood about you, isn't it? That you, you weren't really in the, the family as such at all, were you? You were sort of on the outside of it. And you just you know, I was one of a large number of people who used to come out there and visit. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Charlie made his inroads. He, he did um, involve himself with people involved in, you know, in the music business, as you know. Um, in trying to, I don't know whether... He, it's hard to say because uh, you know I don't know whether he really had any aspirations to um, to market his music. I think that he did, uh, despite the fact that he would sort of uh, put on this uh, show of not wanting to do that. You know that this was like buying into the system and all that. But and by the same token, he would attract those types of people, to him, and he would uh, seek them out. So it's hard to say what what was really going on there. Uh, I know that for me, to, you know, my interest in getting him into the studio and getting his songs down, you know, in some form, some coherent form, uh, was a struggle. And all the time I knew him, you know, uh, you know roughly two and a half years or so, uh, close to three years, I had known him, and um, you know, I would try to get him into the studio, try to you know get some songs down, and uh, and get frustrated with it and say see you later, and I'd be gone again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that's kind of the, that's really the, the that's what our relationship was like all, all the time anyway. I think you probably agree. It was, it was probably one of your less fortunate professional contacts. Though. Yeah, I would say, <laughs> I would say so. You know. yeah. But, you know, it, it intrigued me that he, he, would have, he had a lyrical style that was similar, in a sense, to what I was doing instrumentally, which was, you know, to play spontaneously, to be able to, to like, you know, create this sort of, um, or fall into this sort of natural flow and, and be able to, uh, to, 
paint symphonies on the spot, you know, that sort of thing. That was always been, uh, and it always been my interest musically, and I had uh, been able to form relationships with uh, like that, you know, uh, professional relationships, or artistic relationships with individuals, musicians, who could do that instrumentally. You know, you know the orchestra was that way. We had uh, our tunes were basically frameworks in which we would improvise and play spontaneously. And, you know, each time it would be completely different. Well, playing music with Charlie was very much the same. You know, it was like that, except that he was adding that lyrical element, making it a song rather than an instrumental piece of music. And uh, that was intriguing. You know, it was uh, for, for uh, a musician that was interested in, in music the way I was interested in it, that was intriguing. And uh, it's unfortunate that more didn't come of it. Right, I, I don't want to talk about all that, you know, you know what I mean, in, in any detail. The, the only thing I would ask you is, how do you look back on, you know, your, the Manson thing now, 25 years on? Oh, my God. You know, my regrets are that uh, I didn't see uh, where it was headed. You know, I couldn't, I didn't have enough foresight. I wasn't long-viewed or wide-viewed enough to see that this is where it was headed. Because I'm sure certainly either would have... Uh, try to influence it in going a different direction, um, or I would have just got the hell out of Dodge. You know, but you know, I did get caught up in, in circumstances that uh, have resulted in me forfeiting a lot of uh, a lot of things in my life. And uh, I'm not alone in that. I mean, there are some people that, in fact, everyone that was involved with him uh, was be really, I think, betrayed. Um, I mean, he, he had the trust of the people that were with him, and uh, I think he betrayed that trust. Sure. And that's really a, a tragedy. I mean, the, the killings themselves were a tragedy. Um, and uh, you know, they were horrendous events. Um, sure. Uh, this, you know, the, uh, um, I don't know, you know, everything, about, there's, there's so many different ways of looking at this. I mean, there is a, Charlie's personal rage. Uh, was expressed to the people that were with him. Um, I don't know, you know, my, uh, you know, the crime that I, I committed, the, the killing of Gary Hammond that brought me to prison, um, that was an event that occurred before, you know, the Tate Lab Young, the main, you know, events that everybody knows about, and I was in jail at the time this thing happened. And the motivations and whatnot were completely different, as far as I could tell. You know, I mean, I know I wasn't there uh, to kill Gary Hinman, to start Helter Skelter, or to start a race war, or any of this other kind of stuff that was supposedly going on with these other killings. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a personal thing. It was uh, related to.